Thank you very much, Professor Connor, for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. And I'm talking about Brazilian perceptions of Brazil, past and present. How do Brazilians see themselves, view themselves, and their country? Brazilians are fascinated by the question of who they are and what, uh, of what the, their culture is like. And since the late 19th century, if not before, uh, with the problem of authenticity and of what makes Brazil, Brazil. But to approach this topic, though, and to talk about how Brazilians see themselves is, of course, to enter a minefield. Why? Well, to start with, I'm going to speak, to be speaking on behalf of almost 200 million people uh, who live in a country that is the size of a continent, uh, who speak the same Portuguese official language, but come from all corners of the world, both in the past and in the present, with the new waves of immigrants from Haiti, Bolivia, Korea, Nigeria, Senegal, and many others. And all that without counting the almost 900,000 million, uh, 900,000 indigenous people who belong to 305 ethnicities and speak 274 languages. So, in other words, it's absolutely necessary to remember this immense diversity, which makes it impossible for anyone to give a full account of Brazilians' multiple perceptions of Brazil. With this warning, I'd like to start by talking about one of the most powerful Brazilian senses of collective identity, which has been linked to its heterogeneous origin, the result of generations and generations of interbreeding between the indigenous people, the Portuguese colonizers, followed then later, much later by other Europeans and Asians, and the African slaves who arrived in the country in greater numbers than in many parts of the Americas. During the competition for the location of the 2016 Olympic Games, President Lula made a speech to a foreign audience that included some very revealing words. Speaking about the Brazilian sense of identity, he declared, with his words, we are a people in love with sports, in love with life. Our men and women come from uh, every continent. Americans, Europeans, Africans, Asians. We are all proud of our origins, but even more proud of being Brazilian. We are not only a mixed people, but a people who likes very much to be mixed. That is our identity. Well, this passage offers an example of the official use of one idea of Brazilian identity, as if everyone in the country agreed with this description of Brazil as a land of joyful and cheerful people in love with life, where everybody lives in harmony and is friendly with one another. This view of Brazil that Lula presented as our identity despite being often denounced in Brazil itself as pure idealization, um, is not confined to the country, but has become part of the public imagination abroad as well. When foreigners think of Brazil, when the international press refers to Brazil, they usually associate it with, with carnival, football, sun, beaches, and sex, uh, shanty towns and violence, as well, I'm afraid. But perhaps most of all, with cultural hybridity, racial mixture, and lack of discrimination on the grounds of color. For centuries, however, this positive view of miscegenation and hybridity was not the norm. So how did people reach this view of Brazil as a quasi-paradise of human relations? For this view, although controversial and not unanimous, is still quite very widespread. There is a virtual consensus, among scholars at least, that a dramatic change in the self-perception of Brazilians took place in the early 1930s. 
and that the archie ideologist of this new perception was Gilberto Freire, a leading social thinker and historian who was also the most famous intellectual in 20th century Brazil. Freire's importance to Brazil is so great that when one can surely say that he has become part of the biography of the country. His role as national, uh, in the national culture has been compared to a flash of lightning, to an avalanche, to an earthquake, which shook a whole generation, transformed the cultural life of Brazil, and continues to cause waves. Even when his name is forgotten, the views he put forward continue to be very important for the way in which Brazilians think about, discuss, and love their country. Some people would say, and hate their country. The change was so great that one can say that Brazil was reinvented, and that low national self-esteem, which was deeply ingrained, um, uh, was replaced by national pride. Both Freire's critics and admirers talk of him as the inventor of Brazil, of modern Brazil. And the description has its points. For the positive view of mixing, which he's supposed to have inaugurated, would have been possible to find as late as the 1930. Until then, the mixture of races and cultures that made Brazil was generally viewed negatively by most Brazilians and foreigners alike made up of a miscegenation of the, what they call the three sad races, uh, Brazil, the country was thought to lack an identity of its own. Abroad, the Swiss uh, scientist Louis Agassiz was an authority frequently quoted when the theme was racial mixing. Having visited the country on a scientific mission, he published his book, A Journey to Brazil, in 1868. But his description of Brazil was taken as a matter of fact for decades and decades and decades to come. So this is one uh, fragment of people always quote. Let anyone, quoted in the past, let anyone who doubts the evil of the mixture of races and is inclined from mistaken philanthropy to break down all the barriers between them come to Brazil. He cannot deny the deterioration consequent upon the amalgamation of races, more widespread here than in any country in the world. And it is rapidly effacing the best qualities of the white man, the Negro, and the Indian, leaving a mongrel, nondescript type deficient in physical and mental energy. According so to the prevalent view, besides ugliness, Laziness, indolence, intellectual weakness, and immorality were associated with miscegenation and explained much of what was wrong with the country and hindered its future development. As a result of hybridity, Brazil was supposed to suffer from a lack of spirit and from an inferiority complex, and also from sadness. Uh, that a very well-known writer, Paulo Prado, uh, considered a main trace of Brazilian character. In his famous book of 1928, Portrait of Brazil, Retrato do Brasil, he, in which he, he refers to the vices of our mestizo origin, the book starts like this. In a radiant country lives a sad people. In this context, one possible solution envisaged was the whitening of the population, defended, among others, by the Brazilian sociologist Oliveira Viana who put forward his ideas at a time that mass immigration from Europe was transforming the south of Brazil as had already transformed Argentina and Uruguay. He welcomed this move as a much needed Aryanization of the country, the only way to put on the right road of the, to develop. So when Freire put forward his ideas about the value of, mis of miscegenation in Casa Grande e Senzala, his book, Turning the conventional wisdom upside down, these views, views were unusual and either shocking or fascinatingly subversive and welcome. So what was he really then doing with his work? Well, he was 
confronting a long-established view already expressed by Agassiz in 1868, but which was achieving much greater scientific status in the early 20th century, 20th century with the development of the so-called science of race. Now, uh, and the view that was being developed was that, the, uh, the view that civilization and purity of race walked hand in hand, and while polluting and degenerating contact with the lower races should be avoided at all costs. As a character in the Great Gatsby, the novel Great Gatsby put it, it's all scientific stuff. It's been proved. So, um, in this context, nothing positive would be expected from a country like Brazil, populated by a mongrel race and ruled by a mulatto government, as the stereotype asserted. The young Freire himself had been no exception to this view, and like so many of the Brazilian white elite, was deeply pessimistic about the country's prospects at a time when a stable hierarchical society was disappearing. The Brazilian aristocracy, which had once been so powerful and accomplished, he complained. Now, consort, his words, consorted with fat mulatas with fuzzy hair and were be, being reduced to people without dignity. And to a friend, Freire lamented at the same time, why was I not born an Englishman or even a German in a letter? So while living in, you, in the United States, where even the whites in Latin America were not considered white enough, they were referred to as suspiciously swarthy, Freire was positively impressed by the efficacy and skill with which that country was confronting a similar situation, situation to Brazil's, uh, with segregation, which he admired, and also with the, um, the um, trying to make, uh, to allow only the better stock of people, that means mainly the Nordics, to come into the country. The change in Freire's view of Brazilian race problem did not take place suddenly, but eventually, he learned that the science he so much admired was in fact a pseudoscience that simply gave scientific airs to prejudices and was able then to think about Brazil in different terms, placing the emphasis not on race, but on culture. Miscegenation, in his view then, ceased to be a problem and purity ceased to be a condition for civilization because there was, he discovered there was no scientific basis for opposing one and praising the other. Um, the problems of the country were not racial, but social and environmental. Anthropology had convinced Freire that the population of Brazil needed to become educated, needed to become healthy, and not rather than replaced. In Freire's new interpretation, the evils and vices attributed earlier to the black and mixed population could not be considered any longer innate to their race. They were, the causes of the problem were uh, in the social and economic slave system. For this new Freire, to talk about race inferiority or superiority was as absurd as it would be to deny the cultural wealth of the Indians and the blacks who enriched Brazil through the interpenetration of cultures. Many domains, cuisine, agriculture, mining, music, architecture, religion, and so on, revealed the civilizing function of both the blacks and the Indians. He, in fact, uses the expression civilizing mission when referring to the role played by the African slaves in national culture. And this is 1933. In this way, he offered a response both to the whitening solution proposed earlier in Brazil and to the segregationist solution practiced in the United States. Particularly shocking for some was the famous affirmation with which he opens a chapter of his book. So his words, every Brazilian, even the light-skinned fair one, carries about with him on his soul 
where not on soul and body alike, the shadow, or at least the birthmark of the native or the black. In this interpretation, perhaps, or for sure, the biggest enrichment brought by miscegenation came from its softening influence on Brazil. The racial mixing which permeated the patriarchal system, the plantations, was the oil, he uses the word, that lubricated the economic system and the source of the relative social harmony that had become part of the country's character. In short, being mixed was not an obstacle to the development of Brazil or an obstacle to the development of a positive identity. It was, being mixed was that identity. It should be added that far from being idyllic, Freire's view, portrayal of Brazil, was itself a mixture of negative and positive elements. Indeed, that was a rather appropriate way for a defender of miscegenation to demonstrate his view that multiplicity and an inevitable impurity permeates the human condition. Men, he said at one point, are not either this or that. They are both this and that. Many are mixed, not only in race, but also in sex. Not only ideas, but also in their feelings. As a critic once put it very well, Freire revels in impurity throughout the book demonstrate that there was no pure or better caste on the colonization of Brazil in order to defend his thesis that all Brazilians share a mestizo cultural heritage. The question that minder digressively, digressively through the book are who corrupted whom first? Who civilized whom? Civilized whom? Who was sicker and dirtier? The Portuguese, the African, or the Indians? In discussing race mixture, for instance, Freire does not deny that it involved sadism, sadism and masochism. But in, uh, but in spite of that, as in a tragic, com tragic comedy, he offers a narrative of conflict and suffering which produced a relatively harmonious result or a fraternal tendency in the society. In other words, Freire's new interpretation of Brazil offers a complex history of unintended consequences and not a single, simple, and naive history of good colonizers consciously creating an inviolable country. The success of this new interpretation was not confined to the literati. Over the years, Casa Grande uh, enjoyed a popular success that, is, that few history books can match, appealing to both an academic and a wider public. And its author achieved the attain the status of a popular icon. Besides more than 40 editions and translations into nine languages, it has been transformed into a comic book, a television miniseries. It was used as, as themes for carnival floats and parades. Well, uh, uh, its name was given to a hotel in the Northeast. While two directors, one of them Roberto Rossellini, uh, plan to turn it into a film. It also inspired novels and music. And these different media convey to a much wider public a set of ideas that otherwise would be confined to a smaller group. Many of Jorge Amado's novels, for instance, may be seen as a translation into fiction of themes that are central in Casa Grande, like miscegenation, African tradition, one of the the books that I most love is the uh, Tent of Miracles of 1969. He fictionalizes the questions, the debate over mestizage, over miscegenation. And he, referring to the book, he says to what he did, there is only one solution for the racial problem, the mixture of blood. No other solution, only this one, which is born from love. So it's interesting at this point to consider uh, the way this interpretation of Brazil circulated beyond its borders, because it reveals the importance of a transnational flow of ideas in the building of national identities and people's self-perceptions. In the case of Brazil, this is certainly true when you think about the idea of racial democracy as the consequence of miscegenation. Uh, because in this question, in this issue, 
North Americans and Brazilians have, at different moments, defined themselves in contrast to each other. One thing that historical research shows is that when Freire's views started to circulate abroad, Brazil had already been pictured for almost a century, at least among a certain small circles, as a unique place in racial relations, especially among lead leading members of the North American black community. The Brazilian solution, as it was called, for the race problem was being acknowledged and praised since the 1840s. Okay? In 1858, the black leader and ex-slave Frederick Douglass, he gave a speech in New York, noting, not without irony, that his words, even a Catholic country like Brazil, a country that we stigmatize as semi-barbarian, does not treat its people of color, free or slave, in the unjust, barbarous, and scandalous way we treat them. The contrast between what was then called the American racial hell and the Brazilian racial paradise was already established by the time the Civil War, American Civil War ended. Led then by an immense desire on the part of the African Americans to found somewhere what they lacked at home, uh, several schemes for the emigration of African Americans to Brazil were put forward by a few of its leaders, even before slavery was abolished in Brazil in 1888. The flourishing black press, in the pages of which one can find the highest praise uh, of the Brazilian solution, the, in these pages we can see uh, they gave a lot of support to this idea of emigration, which continued to be proposed throughout the first half of the 20th century. Veterans of the First War and the Second World Wars were willing to emigrate in order to spare their children the humiliating experience of fighting in this Jim Crow army, as one journalist put it. Even dogs and cats leave home when they are mistreated. In Brazil, where there are no Jim Crow, Jim Crow signs, and where one of its greatest presidents, Nilo Peçanha, was a Negro, is the right choice. So, either by serving as a model of a society that by promoting miscegenation avoids discrimination, or by being a land of promise uh, to which African Americans could emigrate, Brazil was seen by some groups as a solution for American racial problems. So, considering the existence of this long though minority tradition, that is what is reasonable to say is that Freire's work developed and formalized the popular view or the myth of a Brazilian harmonious race relations, giving it the legitimacy of a social scientist's stamp. As the Second World War approached, though, Freire's book acquired greater importance in a much wider circle, much wider and influential circle in the United States. Also, the timing of his book, coinciding with the rise of the myth of race purity, um, encouraged commentators to ignore the nuances of Freire's interpretation, nuances that undermine the rosy view to which he is criticized, for which he is criticized. The, historical, the historian Louis Rank for instance, he welcomed in 1939 a book that, as he put it, defended a doctrine loaded with political dynamite. A dynamite that, if exploded, could counteract the fascist and Nazi ideologies that were spreading all over the world. The impact of Freire's view is even more impressive when we note that the US Congress used his ideas in 1942 uh, to raise awareness of the importance of Brazilian cooperation for the destruction of Nazis in the old world and also for the combat against race prejudice in their own American soil and elsewhere. From Freire's work, the congressmen were told, the world and, so I'm reading now their words in, this, in the Congress, the, the world and the Americas have much to learn 
in how diverse races and cultures can live together in harmony and contribute jointly to the development of a new civilization. Okay, this is in the Senate Papers, 1932-42. This was the context for the first English translation of Casa Grande, finally published in 1946, under the title, The Masters and the Slaves. Well, Brazilian perceptions of their own country were, of course, greatly affected by the sudden rise of Brazil importance in the world's imagination, which reinforced national pride, of course. Another important reinforcement of this view of Brazil as a model for other nations came from a book by the internationally famous Austrian Jewish writer Stefan Zweig, then living in exile. The book entitled Brazil, Land of the Future, was the result of his experience and observations at a time when the old world from which he had fled was falling to pieces. Published in 1941 in Stockholm in German and launched simultaneously in five other languages in various countries, Brazil, land of the future, became a bestseller, the middle of the war. Having arrived for the first time in Brazil, as Stefan Zweig recalls, with European arrogance, he was soon surprised and humbled to find, as he put, a new kind of civilization that demanded the admiration of the whole world because for having found the answer for his words again, the simple and most important question, what can we do to make it possible for human beings to live peacefully together despite all the differences of race, color, religion, and creed. Zweig's list of Brazilian qualities, friendliness, peacefulness, peaceful way of thinking, spirit of conciliation, humanitarian behavior, cordiality towards foreigners, tolerance, etc., 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 are presented by Zweig as the result of a nation, nation built upon the principle of a free and unsuppressed miscegenation. In total contrast, as he put it, with the countries ruled by the insane attempt to breed people racially poor, like race, horse, race horses, and dogs. Of, con of course, contrasting Brazil with Europe, from the Europe uh, from which he had fled, he sees the country through rose-tinted rose spectacles. But the important thing, however, is that like the inside of Freire, Zweig is aware of the potential positive consequences of miscegenation. miscegenation. The fate of Stefan Zweig's book was not what the author in, had hoped for. Instead of being understood as a call for the world to emulate Brazil in the future, in tolerance, spirit of conciliation, love of peace, etc., Brazil, a land of the future, was misinterpreted in Brazil itself as a longing for the country, Brazil, to become strong in economic and political power, a power it still didn't have but could achieve in the future. And because of this misinterpretation, the title very much, very soon lent itself to a joke, which surfaces whenever the country's self-esteem is low, right now. Brazil is the joke, is a land, land of the future, and it always will be, as Professor. Despite its immense natural resources, so the joke goes, Brazilians have long displayed the remarkable ability to squander its vast potential. It has been well said that one of the reasons for the success of the positive view of Brazil over the long term was that it was flattering for a substantial proportion of Brazilians and told them, of course, what they wanted to hear. Nevertheless, the veracity of this quasi-paradise of race relations has been increasingly challenged more recently, together with other so-called virtues of the country. As far as racial harmony is concerned, Brazilians seem to be divided now into two main opposed, opposed points of view. View A. This side, there is the Freudian position of Brazilians that are, they are mixed and love to be mixed. Okay? This position has both an extreme form, which sees racial relations as paradisiacal, and a moderate form 
which sees Brazil as relative harmonious, relatively harmonious, with zones of fraternization in sports, for instance, and carnival, coexisting with zones of discrimination, like in employment. In other words, the moderate form accepts the fact that racial harmony coexists with inequality, which they explain by class rather than by color or race, as it has been repeated over and over again, race lines still follow class lines, which means that the lower the class, the darker the blood. That was one of the most, or that is one of the most insidious legacies of slavery. Both these forms, the moderate and the extreme, can be illustrated from the impressions of foreigners who observe Brazil from the, stand, from the standpoint of, cont of contrasting realities. One revealing example is that of the American African, the, the African American pop singer Diana Warwick, who gave an interview to a British newspaper some years ago, explaining why she had decided to make Brazil, the city of Salvador, her home. So her words, for me, Brazil is paradise. It really is. I think that is where God lives. Where I come from, people can stigmatize me because of the color of my skin. In Brazil, I haven't seen this happen. Visitors in general often comment that they cannot think of anywhere in the world where everyday social relations with people that one does not know are so warm and friendly. And also people comment, foreigners comment, that maybe there isn't anywhere else in the world that they see so many people laughing and smiling, even the, the, the poor. Uh, English would say maybe because it's the sunshine. <clears throat> the other side, on the other side, so, um, so this side accepts the, the, the positive view or the racial, not paradise, but fraternal uh, situation of Brazil. On the other side, there has been growing a movement of counter-hybridity uh, on the grounds that the praise of hybridity denies the separate identities of both the indigenous people and the African Americans. It's in this context that the Brazilian black conscious movement stresses negritude, denounces Freire's view as a way to get rid of the blacks, and is associated with identification with Africa. Supporters of one view criticize the other, of course. So supporters of this last view criticize the first view uh, saying that they see Brazil through rose-colored spectres, and even they criticize them for, for what they call ethnic lynching. So they try to forget the indigenous people and the blacks. And so the other ones, the, the first, uh, the one that I mentioned before, they criticize this point here, the, the, the movement of counter-hybridity, uh, saying that they encourage division and conflict in a society in a society that has relatively harmonious relations. Even if the view of, uh, is a total myth, they say, the racial uh, harmony is a total myth or utopia, it's, more, it's a more beneficent myth than the myth of two races, two separate races, which, and this myth of separate races can in fact lead, actually lead to conflict. So I think this is, more or less what is, is happening. If racial relations is still in debate in Brazil are a legacy of slavery, other characteristics of Brazil being discussed today are also viewed as part of that legacy. Three main points I want to talk about now. Three main points stand out today as particularly relevant in Brazilians' discussions about themselves and Brazil. Three questions. They are discussing around the three questions. First, are we authoritarian and hierarchical or egalitarian? Second question, are we gentle or violent? Third question, are we self-confident and proud or do we suffer from an inferiority complex? So first point, Brazil operates by a system which allows for more than a single set of rules. In other words, in personal rules and equality before the law, like any modern nation, have their place in society. 
but also thus a heritage of slavery in which hierarchical, authoritarian, and personalistic relations prevail, together with favor, patronage, nepotism, all values and practice inherited from the patriarchalism of the plantations, colonial times. There is um, a revealing saying about this typical Brazilian way of thinking. The saying says, for, for friends, everything. For enemies, the law. This has been exasperating observers and commentators over more than a century. And it must be, perhaps, behind the fame of Brazil as a refuge for criminals. A cliche is still used in some films, although the law has changed. Um, Laws that should apply to all the members of society on a legalitarian and universal basis exist, but are sidestepped, so goes the argument, when they interfere with what is deeply ingrained in, in the Brazilian ethos, the importance of personal relations, family relations, friendship relations. The cordial man, woman cordial, the cordial man, as an expression used by the historian Sergio Buarque, to describe one of the aspects of the Brazilian character refers precisely to the high level of emotions be, uh, that are behind people's behavior, which leads, emotions which lead to this propensity to superimpose family and personal relations on professional and public ones. It's this tendency to reject the impersonality of the public systems, which is thought to explain the rarity of public figures in Brazil, who put the interest of the state or, or of the public good um, above the, those of friendship, I mean, the true public figures, the lack of this. That's the argument. A side step of this tendency is that when the personal relations do not work, in sidestepping the law, Brazilians tend to find ways, jeitos, jeitinhos, to subvert the egalitarian, universalist order of the legal system. The phrase, do you know with whom you're talking to? I'm a friend of such and such, I'm a uh, cousin of such and such, is, for example, part of a ritual that happens in specific situations, like in a tra traffic offense and has the role of bring, bring, bringing back into the public sphere the authoritarian, hierarchical, and personalistic values that have been part of the culture since colonial times. So uh, it's a traffic warden feels sometimes, or probably feels, uh, used to feel at least until, um, very uh, humbled if someone pretends to be so important. So, Carnival, on the other hand, also performs a ritual, but not of replacing equality by inequality, as in the last example, but of replacing the inequality of everyday life by equality. It's like a ritual of a disorder. Roberto da Mata, anthropologist, used this expression, because it allows people to change social, social places, even briefly. The poor disguise themselves as rich, in their sumptuous garments and parades. And for a while, the social hierarchy is suspended and the people become equal to their superiors. So it more or less invents hope. I mean, carnival is an occasion, like a self, uh, um, I forgot the expression, uh, escape, self escape, no. Um, well, anyway, invents the hope for a better future, for a few days, no, briefly, and this is acceptable. The reaction, the reaction of Brazilians to this state of affairs is twofold. On one side is to believe that the rule of the law and therefore the modernity of the country doesn't exist, is only a veneer. The coexistence of the modern and the traditional is seen as just messy, illogical, incoherent. And only when the traditional elements of society fade away, 
one, one day they fade away, could the development of modernity, true modernity, happen? And Brazil would then be a tropical version le of, let's say, Canada. Okay. The other form of reaction to this so-called contradiction in Brazilian society is to say that no such a fade away erasure of these traditional elements is possible. And even if it's possible, it would, would not be desirable. Uh, and that Brazilian society is neither traditional nor modern, but both. Like Freire would say, it's this and that. The ability to bend rules, which characterize the everyday life in Brazil, together with other social practices, such as nepotism, are not seen as always corrupt. They are seen, they are seen as performing some, some functions, some, some useful functions, complementary functions allowing flexibility, allowing conciliation, not all the times, but many times. So one can be liberal and modern in Congress, for instance, and paternalistic at home. Conflicts remain, nevertheless. Some Brazilians, for instance, argue that the bulk of the economic and social elite only accept people, the common people, or a democracy as a way of life when they are taking part in a football match, in carnival, Okay, things like this, where only talent and not social hierarchy counts. So all the same, part of what is behind the social unrest of the last years seems to be connected to the disappointment of the public with the politicians who are elected by using a modern rhetoric, many times elected by using a modern rhetoric of democratic principles, but actually follow practice of patronage even though this patronage are socially acceptable in everyday life, many, in many circumstances. So there is a problem there. The coexistence of modern and traditional politics is an example of other coexistence or mixtures, which might seem paradoxical, like that of a Catholic country like Brazil, which worships both the Catholic saints and the African orishas spirits at the same time. But as the anthropologist Robert D'Amata and his followers argue, these mixtures of being this and that are exactly what makes Brazil, Brazil. How about gentleness and violence? This combination is also a puzzle which Brazilians frequently face and debate and are facing a debate more and more now. How can a country that is renowned for its cordiality towards foreigners, tolerance, peacefulness. It has not entered a war with its neighbor countries since 1860s, Paraguay. How can this country be also a seat of violence, of high homicide rates, of a rise in vigilant groups, and which, according to a book recently published by the sociologist, sociologist José Martins, is also one of the leaders, I'm afraid to say this, in lynching in the world. Just to give some number about this, according to the statistic of 2013, in the UK, the annual homicide rate is one homicide per 100,000 inhabitants, while in Brazil, it's 25.2 homicide per 100,000 people. The violence, this violence reveals, according to many Brazilians, the other side of the national so-called cordiality. The two passionate sides of the population, both the warm behavior towards others, which exists, and violent actions, both coming from the heart. This aggressive side is revealed as well in the verbal violence that the social media disseminates and in a certain way stimulates, which is very much in today in Brazil. And this in a country that has been described recently by the Wall Street Journal as the social, me social, social media capital of the universe because of the number of users that is growing such a speed because, as they say, because of Brazil's hyper-social relational culture. In such a state of affairs, there are those who think that only the laws 
the legal system, and a bigger police force could put things right, restore order, and deal with conflicts in society. For others, the prevailing violence is the result of inequality, drug trafficking, injustice in society. And only when social solutions are found would there be hope for change. And according to a third group, although it's not very outspoken or visible, unfortunately, one of the most important ways the problem of violence could be tackled is by doing what consecutive governments have completely failed to do. Educate the public in citizenship, democracy, and human rights. As a commentator put it recently, democracy was printed in millions of copies of the Constitution of the Republic, but not in the hearts and minds of the public Brazilian population. And finally, the third point, self-confidence versus inferiority complex. A contrast that's much discussed today is that between the self-confidence of a nation proud of its origins and of its historical role and the inferiority complex that comes to the surface intermittent, intermittently, bringing back the disbelief which still haunts Brazilians in the future of a mixed country, in the future of a country which lies in the periphery of the modern Western world. The prestige of foreigners among Brazilians may be illustrated by the very common habit of asking them, asking the foreigners, what they think about Brazil and Brazilians as soon as they get there. When friends from Brazil and other places visit Brazil, friends, sorry, friends from England and other places visit Brazil, they always comment with surprise about, uh, on the question they soon hear from Brazilians. Está gostando? Uh, I, do you like Brazil? And how happy they are to hear that they and their country are liked. Brazil, so goes the argument, seems to be always ready to tell stories against itself, even when the stories prove to be wrong. As in the case of the remark, uh, the remark allegedly made by Charles de Gaulle about Brazil not being a serious country. Brazil n'est pas un pays sérieux. In spite of the actual person who said the phrase, who was the ambassador of France, uh, Brazilian ambassador in, uh, to France, uh, in spite of him admitting that he, he, he said that, not the goal, the phrase is remembered as said by the power of the goal and as proof of how badly foreigners think of us. It serves, as a commentator put it, as a whip for our exercises in self-flagellation. Like the joke about Brazil being forever waiting for a future that never arrives. A very revealing story that complements this joke and that comes to the surface every now and then, and it's certainly been at the surface now, says, probably many of you have heard, but it's the Brazilians who connect to Brazil, says that after God created the world and made Brazil, he started to hear a lot of complaints from inhabitants of other countries about his unfairness in the distribution of national, national resources and beauty. Brazil was a rich land of extreme beauty where the sun always shone without deserts, earthquakes, snowstorms, typhoons, hurricane, hurricanes, etc. It's not fair, they all said to God in chorus. Then God silenced all criticism and envy by replying, it is true, but wait and see the kind of people I'll put there. So the demonstrations against the World Cup that happened in, in 2013 was interpreted by some Brazilian and foreign, uh, mainly Brazilians, but maybe a few of foreign observers, as not so much a protest against lack of good public service and bad use of public money, but much more as the revival of Brazilians' deep-seated insecurity and lack of self-esteem. It was as if the demonstrators were preempting the possibility of failure and disappointment in the games and in the whole organization of the event by trying to stop the World Cup from happening. <clears throat> it was the playwright Nelson Rodriguez, who was a great, also a great fan of football, he coined the phrase mongrel complex to refer to, Brazil, to Brazilians, to what Brazilians suffer, which helps to understand the devastating defeat of Brazil by Uruguay 
in the World Cup of 1950. That's when this phrase started. The problem is faith in oneself, he said. With, his, with this phrase, mon, uh, mongrel complex, he also wanted to refer, in general, to Brazilian deference towards foreigners, whom they see as, they tend to see as superiors, and their inability to deal with them as equals on the basis of mutual respect. So according to Nelson Rodriguez and many other people who followed him in this respect, the mongrel complex is ingrained in the Brazilian soul alongside national pride, pride which is nevertheless, national pride is nevertheless too weak to confront that complex, which is always lying in wait to come to the surface again and again. But I'd like to end this um, talk on a note of optimism, which funnily enough comes from Europe and is annoying many Brazilians <clears throat> who seem to be in a phase of self-examination, but in a pessimistic mood, very pessimistic mood. Domenico Di Masi, a sociologist from Italy who has been visiting and is studying Brazil for the last 40 years or so, has been accused of being a new Stefan Zweig. He's a great admirer of some Brazilian interpreters of Brazil, like Darcy Ribeiro and Gilberto Freire. And like them, he's impressed with the country's vibrancy and joy, and what, by what Darcy Ribeiro referred to as the astonishing wild, uh, sorry, by the astonishing will for happiness in a people who have seen so much sacrifice. Interesting that Machado de Assis, our greatest writer perhaps, uh, was also fascinated by the question of who, who are we? And in the 1890s, he said that the Brazilians love things that make them happy and that bring, th things that bring them the pleasures of the sense. That's why they love sports, they love dance, they love music. Dimasi, Domenico Di Masi, recently published a book entitled The Future Arrived, Models for a Disoriented Society. In this book, Brazil, among other places, is chosen as a model because it has many positive things with which to inspire the world, in spite of its many problems of violence, corruption, inequality, etc. So cultural miscegenation, religious syncretism, and pacific way of in we, with which Brazilians have been solving their problems are some of the basis of the Brazilian model. Denouncing the Brazilian intellectuals as suffering from the mongrel complex, which prevents them from seeing the country's positive sides, Dimasi talks about the need for them, us Brazilians, to raise their self-esteem and contribute to the positive discussion that the country so much needs. I'll just have time to read some of his words from an interview to give you an idea of his optimistic approach. So I went with his words. The Brazilian people contains, contains dozens and dozens of ethnicities. It's not free from racism, but Brazilian racism is certainly much more mild, much more mild than the North American or the Muslim. The Slavic countries suffered for, for centuries from a fratricidal war between their four or five ethnicities. Each country in Europe made wars, for ev uh, made wars every 10, 30, 100 years against its neighbors. Italy, Austria, and Germany provoked two world wars. Brazil has frontiers with 10 countries and only made war once against Paraguay in the 1860s. The social movements of the last year, he was referring to 2013, are not, contrary, are not contrary to the pacific vocation of the Brazilian people. They are simply a just rebellion against corruption and against state violence. But during so many months of urban conflict, there was not one single death. In France, to take power, the bourgeoisie guillotine 23,000 aristocrats and members of the opposition. Okay, 
Thank you.